When someone says the word psychopath, what does that mean to you? And more importantly, who do you look at? I noticed a few glances going around the room as I said that. But don't worry, this is not an invitation to out your husband or your boyfriend or your, your boss or <clears throat> your lawyer, but I suppose if someone's going to come out here with a talk entitled Psychopaths and Three Reasons Why We Need Them, it'd better start off on a note of clarification. So let me give you three. Firstly, I'm not here to endorse or condone or um, glorify antisocial behaviour or emotional abuse. Too many people who have been identified as psychopathic have inflicted that kind of damage and trauma on families and communities as it is without me encouraging more of that. Secondly, what we come to know about so-called psychopaths, and I hope you forgive my liberal use of that term today, but what we've come to know about so-called psychopaths has come from the criminal justice and forensic research areas. What we know less about are those individuals who don't go on to commit crimes or go to court or go to jail. So we have a large, significant piece of the puzzle that yet to be more fully explored and articulated. And thirdly, the label psychopath, let's be honest, has negative social consequences. I mean, I bet you'll be less inclined to invite someone to your home or hire someone or even click on their dating profile if you knew that they were psychopathic. I mean, when's the last time you saw an ad out there along the lines of desperately seeking tall, dark, handsome psychopath, for instance, or professional couple looking for flatmate <clears throat> must be neat, tidy, and psychopathic, or job opportunity and finances and accounts, experience and psychopathic traits preferred. We don't see these, we don't see these kinds of ads because they're stigmatizing, right? They're unhelpful, and um, they stop new thinking about people. They reinforce an easy narrative that allows us to easy, easily marginalize a vulnerable group, albeit one that makes others vulnerable. So is the social rejection completely warranted? When people think about psychopaths, these are common images that can come to mind. These are famous movie villains, and they do fascinate us, don't they? Because they force us to engage with them on a moral level. They behave outside the laws of society, they act in ways that perhaps are forbidden to you and I, and at least for a period of time, they're kind of successful in doing so. Here's a couple of real-life examples. This, uh, this is Ted Bundy, who was a well-mannered law student, an aspiring politician, but he also embarked on a cross-country project of murdering young women throughout the United States in the 1970s. But he kind of challenged the crazed ex-murderer stereotype of the psychopath, not least because he was handsome, he was intelligent, he was articulate, and he was well-educated. Even at his trial, his judge had commended him on his ability to handle himself in his own defence before he received a death sentence in the 80s. Close to the home is this gentleman, this is Mark Chopper Reed, well known amongst the Australian criminal community as a standover man who famously commented that he never hurt an innocent member of the public, but he certainly had a field day with other criminals. He conducted a campaign of fear and violence which went for many years and involved beatings, stabbings, shootings, pistol whipping, toe cutting, he even kidnapped a judge. He even voluntarily, may I add, had his own ears cut off so he could be moved to a safer part of the prison. So yes, there were actually more hazardous people in him in Australia, but we kind of knew that, didn't we? But um, amongst all of this, amongst all of this, he had a couple of films made about him, he released an award-winning song, and he even published a series of books about his life, amongst other things. And they had great titles like Hits and Memories, or How to Shoot Friends and Influence People. And <laughs> amongst this body of work, what was revealed, really, apart from a dark sense of humour and a keen wit, with some really rare and rich insights into how he had negotiated and survived and even thrived in a very hostile and dangerous social context. Things he went through so we didn't have to. And you can make your own mind up about this one. <laughs> At least cut to the chase. What is psychopathy? Well, unlike other concepts in mental health, such as depression or schizophrenia, psychopathy is still something of a contested concept. I'd even go so far as to say that it's a promiscuous concept. It's a sexy idea that gets around and is prone to abuse and misunderstanding, much like resilience or poverty or maybe democracy. But um, psychologists and psychiatrists have essentially cornered the market on how psychopathy is defined and, by extension, how it ought to be dealt with. One of the earliest known modern cases of what we now recognise as a psychopath goes back some 200 years to France in the early 1800s and concerned a, uh, a difficult man, to be fair, who was prone to quarrels and conflicts with people around him. But we also know that he was wealthy, he was financially astute, and had successfully managed an estate for many years, all of which came to a really sudden end when he threw a woman down a well 
because she had the audacity to disagree with him on some issue. So what we have is a sound rational mind on one hand and quite destructive and self-defeating behaviour on the other, and that's the central mystery of what psychopathy is about, which led one psychiatrist to very famously describe this phenomenon as a mask of sanity. Now, contemporary uh, clinical descriptions have been rather unkind to this group and not even neutral. So here's one. Uh, so this, this is a very uh, well-known modern definition. So psychopathy is a socially devastating disorder defined by a constellation of affective, interpersonal, and behavioural characteristics, intraspecies predators, it's an interesting word, who use charm, manipulation, intimidation, and violence to control others and to satisfy their own selfish needs. So what this is really describing are sinister and scheming individuals whose thoughts, feelings, and behaviours are geared, engineered almost, to sort of target, isolate, and, and exploit us for their own gains. This next one is a bit more recent. This one says, psychopathy is an emotional disorder which puts the person at risk of repeated displays of extreme antisocial behaviour. So not quite as demonising as the previous definition, and this one is somewhat narrower in scope, and does make explicit the relationship between crime and psychopathy. And to be fair, that relationship has been borne out in the research. It's the use of the word disorder which I find quite interesting. Because it kind of frames as a type of medical condition what's really a broad spectrum of quite complex social issues. Philosophers, on the other hand, have a much simpler way of dealing with this. <laughs> now, psychopathy is big business in the popular literature space as well, and here's a selection of bestsellers. And what do we notice about these book covers? They kind of steer out at us, don't they? In a kind of a weird Twilight Zone reversal moment, these books may well be reading us. And what this, I think, kind of does is it perpetuates a malevolent stereotype of a predator lying in wait in the shadows, watching for one of us to stray from the flock before they make their move. And I think what this does is that it sets up an expectation of fear and loathing in the minds of readers about what's really quite a poorly understood group. So, given these issues of public anxieties and violence and crime and whatnot, you may well be thinking, so why do we need these people again? Well, I'm interested in those psychopathic people who are doing things well, those that don't go on to attract legal attention, and they do exist. I want to know what they're doing right, because the more we understand about that group, the more we can understand about this other group that have the potential to harm us in some way. <clears throat> I'm interested in the niches they occupy in society and the roles they have in their communities. And I'm in the process of conducting research, incidentally, on this very question, looking at the lifestyle choices and habits. And I'm looking for volunteers. <laughs> and by now you should know who you are, so, if you're interested, come and see me later. Just please don't hurt me, okay? But, uh, okay, so, in the, in the meantime, and as an exercise in reframing perceptions, here's three ideas I want you to think about. The first need about perhaps why we need psychopaths is that psychopathic traits can actually be advantageous. Psychopaths, in many ways, are the least and most visible members of our communities. Certainly those we hear about are those that tend to inflict significant economic, social, and human costs, but some don't. So are we overlooking the possible strengths of this group? If we think about psychopathy on one level as being an issue of personality, and that personality in a very simplified form is a configuration of attributes and strategies that allow us to negotiate through a wide range of quite complex social interchanges, then being psychopathic to some extent can be quite helpful. There's a number of traits that comprise what we call psychopathic personality. I won't go through all of them, but just a couple of some of the more well, more well known ones. So let's start with um, what we call superficial charm, which is a kind of an insincere sense of appeal. Someone who has this trait may well tell unlikely stories about themselves. They may puff themselves up to be more than what their background or their experience warrants. And we all know someone like this, don't we? But at the same time, these people can be quite engaging. They can have good interpersonal skills, they can form social alliances quite well, they can work through social hierarchies quite well, and if they're refined enough, they can attract mates. They're good at picking up chicks, which, and surely there must be some evolutionary benefit to that somewhere down the line. Fearlessness is another trait, and by fearlessness I'm talking about someone who has a high threshold for anxiety. So they may lead impulsive lifestyles where they may entertain situations that contain some level of danger or risk. And depending on how extensive they entertain that lifestyle of danger and risk, they may well expect to have a, a, a reduced 
quality of life, if not a reduced life expectancy. But by the same token, they may well develop a certain coolness under, under pressure, a greater resilience to stress, and be able to make hard decisions that perhaps you or I might find difficult to do because of our own anxieties and inhibitions about the consequences or the, the cost of those decisions. And perhaps the most notorious trait when we think about psychopathic personality is what we call a lack of empathy, which is really a failure to engage with people in a way which recognises their vulnerabilities and sensitivities. And you will know if you have this trait, if you lose your social alliances as quickly as you make them. If you have a long history of pissing people off, chances are you probably have this trait. But it also means, it also means that you may well be able to pursue life goals unhindered by the concerns of other people. I suppose if we were to genetically engineer the perfect CEO in a very harsh and chaotic capitalist context, we may well want someone who is aggressively competitive, who maybe engages in anti-competitive practices and even takes certain calculated risks. So I suppose the take-home message here is that some psychopathic traits in moderation can be functional and maybe even adaptive in situations where there are social and emotional barriers. So as a thought experiment, you may well ask yourself a question. In this situation, what would a psychopath do, apart from crime, what would a psychopath do and think about what kind of emotional and social barriers are you facing in this particular dilemma that you might be facing at that point in time? The second reason why we might need psychopaths is because I think psychopathic, people with psychopathic traits have the potential to address complex problems in quite unconventional ways. In my experience as a, as a clinician, it's become very apparent over, over the years that People with psychopathic traits are very good at spotting vulnerabilities in people, systems, and situations. They may recognize that you or I will behave a certain way, more or less, because of social and cultural norms and maybe physical and financial constraints, but they may not care about that. We know when we have a life problem because there'd be a significant emotional component attached to that. If, we, if a person tends not to think or feel, rather, too strongly about situations, let alone other people, then they're likely to frame that problem a little differently because the priorities will be different and arguably the solutions will be different as well. Let's take the issue of suffering and coping with suffering. It's been long held that psychopaths tend not to suffer, even if everyone around them does. They may well suffer, but the experience might be different from you and I. They may acknowledge you and I suffer, but they just may not care about it. So to give you a bit of a flavour of this, I've, I've got a letter, which I conveniently had in my pocket, um, this is written to me by a prisoner many years ago uh, when I was involved in an experimental treatment program for psychopathic offenders who had violent histories. And I want you to kind of just, it's not very long, uh, to get a sort of a, a, a sense of how this person has framed an issue and even presented a kind of a solution. So see what you think of this. <clears throat> Dear Armon, thank you for your letter. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to attend your violence prevention program. But to tell you the truth, I don't believe I have an anger problem or think I'm a violent person. If you're enjoying your time down the river and you swat a pesky sandfly, does that mean you have an anger problem? Does that mean it's imperative, it's a genuine letter by the way, does it mean it's, it's imperative you attend a violence prevention program designed for extremely violent people? Of course not, how absurd. And should you be awarded brownie points for not swatting it and instead allow it to gorge itself freely on your blood? No, certainly not. It's not your own choice if you wish to be sandfly fodder. Here's the problem. Now and again, a prisoner will arrive and start behaving like a pesky sandfly. When all attempts, i.e. shooing, talking, apologizing, giving and finally coercing, fail to snap him out of his pesky demeanor, he leaves me no choice but to swat him. And not because I hate him, am angry at him or want to be violent towards him, I just want to enjoy my time at the river. So is it possible that your service could provide these folk with anti-pesky sandfly courses or something like that? <laughs> Name and address with help. <laughs> so I guess the take home message here is that psychopaths can teach us something about addressing complex issues by allowing us to entertain unorthodox thoughts, unintuitive ideas, maybe even prohibitive ideas. So a thought experiment that you can try at home is to ask yourself a question in this situation, what would a psychopath think? And apart from perhaps the obvious antisocial kind of response that might come out of that, what is the principle behind that thought? 
might be interested in what you come back with. And the third reason, perhaps why we need psych psychopaths, there's more of a bigger picture issue, is that perhaps in no uncertain terms, psychopaths tell us what we're willing to tolerate as a society. Psychopaths hold up a mirror to the social health of communities and organisations. I think it was Juvenal, the ancient Roman satirist, who famously said, corruption is a matter of degree. That psychopaths exist is no accident, and perhaps serve as a reminder to us that we have in some way collectively been responsible for allowing those conditions to exist for antisocial behaviour and emotional abuse and whatnot to be able to exist, if not flourish, in parts of our communities. In, in my time working in the prisons, I worked with many men who had were considered psychopathic. And whilst I recognise the pathology, I also recognise that somewhere in that backstory is a really traumatic and damaged history, which has meant qualities like empathy, responsibility, and a deep sense of connectedness with others serve no purpose whatsoever, not even survival value. And has instead been replaced with things like deceitfulness or narcissism, callousness, or even indifference to others. Psychopaths disturb us, I guess, because they are us, but without our sense of moral obligation. They show us what we'd look like without our fears, our anxieties, our self-doubts, recriminations, or our conscience. They see our environment for what it is, but uncluttered with social boundaries and indifference to the feelings of others, and they interact with it accordingly, which is in an instrumental way. A wise botanist friend once told me that a weed is a plant that's growing in the wrong place. And by wrong place, he's talking about that it inflicts damage on surrounding plants because it has to compete somewhat aggressively in order to, to flourish in those areas, so competing with sunlight and soil, water and so forth. And traditional ways of dealing with weeds is to manually pull them out. And if that job's not done properly, we have to go back and keep doing it because more weeds will keep growing. So as you can see, this becomes a multi-generational problem, if you get my meaning. A second approach is to douse the area in herbicide. And you may well target those plants, those weeds that you're after, but you may well contaminate the soil and compromise the healthy growth of those plants that you're trying to retain. But then there's those instances where maybe some weeds are kind of useful. Weeds like dandelions, for instance, can be both pretty to look at and have medicinal purposes. So a weed may actually have a use beyond its status as a weed if we're kind of willing to look a bit further. If we bring that logic back to, to people, that what, without ignoring the hazards that psychopathic individuals may pose to us, Maybe we need to start looking at the strengths, perhaps, of this particular group. So is ostracism or treatment really the answer, as it has been so far? Or is it actually about looking at developing alternative forms of support to try and bring out the best in these individuals who concern us so much? So if that's the case, the thought we need to entertain then is, what do psychopaths want? Which is a question that's really asked. This is a group that's often talked about, but really talked with. So let me leave you with this idea. Psychopaths are unlikely to garner public sympathies anytime soon, and that's perfectly understandable, let's be honest. But they don't just exist in our headlines and movies, they exist in our workplaces, our neighbourhoods, our homes and our lives. So if we are to develop solutions, whatever that means, to the problems of psychopathy, then maybe we need to look at the problem a little differently. We need, to, we need new ways to address old problems. Thank you.